Welcome back. Welcome back. Ten years ago, this weekend, China took control of Hong Kong from Great Britain, its colonial ruler. The handover had been negotiated 13 years earlier with the Chinese authorities by the then Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. Chris Patton was the colony's last governor. He spent the five years up to June the 30th, 1997, preparing for that handover. And he's with me now. Chris, welcome. Nice to be here, David. Uh, it's great to have you with us. You were memorably portrayed uh, at the end of that memorable weekend and so on, that standing on the deck of the Royal Yacht Britannia in tears for a few moments and so on, at that emotional moment, were they tears for Britain, for Hong it Kong, very... or, for the, or for the Royal Yacht Britannia? Well, indeed. it could have been for the Royal Yacht Britannia. As you'll remember, that wonderful old, old ship we decommissioned afterwards and spent the money on the dome instead. Yes. You know, sometimes I think we're mad. <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, it was emotional for three reasons. First of all, because you had a sense that this was an end of something historic. It wasn't just the end of the British Empire, it was the end of empire. Nobody would seek to justify it today, but there were, you know, there were a few good things about it. Um, <clears throat> and it was only later that I realised how much other people identified with that moment outside the UK. Uh, not very long afterwards, I was walking near my house in France, bumped into an aged farmer. Um, he said, have you met the great man who's moved into your village? So we said, uh, no, who's that? So he said, oh, he's a great man. He's been governor of Saigon. So there was, first of all, that moment, um, that feeling that this was a historic moment. Secondly, it had been a wonderful job. Um, uh, you know, probably the best job I'll, I'll ever have. And I was going to miss it. And thirdly, I was leaving behind a place which I'd grown to love, which my family had loved. We'd all had a very happy time there. We were leaving friends. My youngest daughter, who spent most of her secondary education there, cried when she left London when she was 12 and cried when she left Hong Kong aged 17. Yeah, yeah. And, and how, how has Hong Kong fared in the last 10 years, both uh, economically and democratically and so on? In general, it would appear, from a distance, slightly better than predicted. My worry my biggest worry about Hong Kong was that, it, was that it would simply become the richest city in China um, and that it would lose that um, element of the best of the West which it combined with being a very Chinese city. Um, that hasn't happened. Why? Partly because there's such a strong sense of citizenship. You get six or seven hundred thousand people on the street arguing for more democracy for, for defense of their civil liberties. Secondly, because to be fair, um, to the Chinese. I think they've been on best behavior. And while they've intervened a couple of times rather maladroitly in legal cases, and while they've blocked any democratic progress, and sooner or later Hong Kong will be a democracy, what they haven't done is to, inter in was, is to interfere with the rule of law, with the fact that Hong Kong has strong professions and strong civil society, that it has freedom of speech and freedom of religion, and that it has a good civil service and police force. In other words, it has all the bits of a democracy um, that are important, except for the right to vote for its rulers. Right. And, but you said confidently just there, in the middle of that paragraph, sooner or later it will be a democracy. Of course, because um, you can't uh, give people the opportunity to make all the most sophisticated economic choices uh, and then deny them the opportunity to vote for um, the people who decide how their refuse should be collected or how their children should be educated. Um, I don't think that China and Chinese societies are totally different from everywhere else in the world. The Chinese leadership sooner or later themselves, I think not until after the Olympics are out of the way, are going to have to face up to the accountability gap in Chinese society. And one thing they could do is take Hong Kong as a sort of model of how a Chinese society can develop democratic structures without that making it unstable or without producing um, immoderate politicians. Of course there's been another 10-year farewell this week uh, in the sense of Tony Blair stepping down. The end of a dynasty. End of a dynasty, end of an era. The bling dynasty. <laughs> but I mean, do you, I mean, will you miss him? No, not really. Um, I think he was a spectacular performer. Um, he was like a great ice skater and he twisted and turned. And, but I always thought the ice was pretty thin. 
Um, and I think the main criticism of him is he confused politics of, at which he was brilliant with policy. He thought that politics was the same as government, and of course they're not entirely. But um, as, as a performer, he's as pretty well as good as anybody in my lifetime in British politics. I think that it's not going to take long before people um, obser observing the rather doer um, successor, Gordon Brown, will think that perhaps they'd prefer to be cheered up by the, by the sort of, um, um, well, often the vulgarity of the, of the Blair years. But um, no, I won't really miss him. I think that the job he's going to um, for the quartet, um, I wish him well in it. But I think it's going to be very difficult for him because in the Arab world he's very much identified with American foreign policy in the Middle East and with the view that you can never criticize Israel. Secondly, specifically, he's going to be identified with a policy which I think is fundamentally mistaken, which suggests that you can create a sort of um, uh, Fatahstan in the West Bank uh, while you bomb the hell out of a Hamasstan in the Gaza Strip. Um, and I don't myself believe that there is an answer, that there is a solution in the Middle East which excludes Hamas. And in fact, you're saying really it's, it's considered progress that we are prepared to uh, entertain a two-state solution, but you, you're suggesting a three-state solution. Well, th that is unfortunately what is happening, and I think that is a crazy policy to be pursuing. Look, um, if you in Northern Ireland had tried to reach an agreement excluding Sinn Féin IRA, you'd never have got anywhere. Did the IRA kill people? Of course they did. Um, Martin McGuinness was called the butcher's boy and it wasn't because he worked in Dewhurst on a Saturday morning. Um, it was the Americans that pressed us to involve Sinn Féin IRA in order to get a solution and I think it's crazy to say that you can have a solution in the Middle East, and I hope Mr. Blair comes to this conclusion, though I rather doubt it, without involving Hamas. And in fact, in terms of uh, the current, now current regime, Gordon Brown, um, you said once, and you sort of hinted at it there, that you think he's quite a hard sell. Yeah, I think he's, he's a formidable politician and his ruthlessness in acquiring office has been, has been astonishing. He's clever. Um, he's very focused, um, but I don't think people change at the age of 56, and he's a control freak. Um, his, I think, idea of fun is a wet February evening in a Scottish manse. Um, he doesn't have very much charm, uh, and he's going to have to depend on people thinking that um, because of his experience and competence they have to hold on to him. But the first time there is any suggestion of sleaze, during the, Blair, during the Brown administration, he'll be in huge trouble because people will say, well, it's, it's just the same as the Blair years, but without the fun. And therefore, I gather that, uh, from what you were saying, that the rumor that's been around for the last couple of days, that you're going to play a part in this administration, is not true. No, I, I put the point more vulgarly than saying it wasn't true yesterday. <laughs> I had the, had the experience of listening to this being announced on the radio and then being phoned up by the broadcasting company to ask me whether it was true. Um, no, I ha I've had no approaches from Mr Brown or from anybody else. And I'm very much hoping that David Cameron, whom I like personally as well as admire politically, will be the next Prime Minister. I think that what this reminds me of um, is the fact that for all the stuff about a new style of politics, this is what's called spin. Um, all this stuff about a big tent and bringing other people in, well, um, I'm still in the Conservative tent, thank you very much. And finally, one a chance to touch on another one of your bailiwicks, which was Europe. Uh, the latest treaty, as it were, that's been, been agreed last week and so on. Do you think there should be a referendum in the European countries that are involved? Or in the UK? No, it's partly, I have to say, not because of the treaty itself, but because of my rooted opposition to referendums. I don't think it's um, for nothing that referendums were Hitler and Mussolini's favoured constitutional political device. I think in a parliamentary system like ours, referendums undermine Parliament. 
if the issues are so important, they should be at the centre of a general election campaign. And on the whole, it's not a mark of authority when a government reaches for a referendum in order to avoid its destiny being determined by the questions it puts in a referendum. Anyway, the European Union Treaty, the amending treaty, is basically about the relationship between institutions. I mean, a lot of it is is mind-blowingly um, tedious, and I don't think you'd get much excitement in an election campaign about it. People would be arguing, as ever, about completely different issues. It does matter to change the way we operate, given that the European Union now has 27 members. Um, I think the treaty cleans quite a bit up, but it doesn't uh, involved the sort of transfer of sovereignty, the sort of transfer of decision-making that we saw with the single European Act, which was signed by Margaret Thatcher when uh, Norman Tebbit was a big figure in the government going round, I think he was party chairman, uh, telling conservative backbenchers why there shouldn't be a referendum. Um, this involves far less in terms of transfer of sovereignty, so if a referendum wasn't right then, it's not right now. Chris, thank you for being with us. Nice Taking to be on this program. Tour d'horizon around, around the world. Much. Or a tour de gloss, as Dennis Healy used to call it. <laughs> yeah, a tour de gloss, exactly. We well, hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much indeed. I'd like to be on the show. Chris Patton there, the last governor of Hong Kong, talking to me earlier. Next week, we've got a special highlight show coming up. So many people we've got at Highlights the last few weeks and months that we'll be bringing into the show. There's John Bolton, Peter Mandelson, Lewis Hamilton, that incredible motor racing ace, Madeleine Albright from the States, Sophie ellis Bexter with her guitar and so on. Just to name a few. That's a pack show of our Highlight show next week. And then the week after that, uh, I'll be joined here in the studio in a new show by Mikhail Gorbachev, the man who changed the world, and Helen Mirren, who won the Oscar. Not a bad double. See you then.